Hello, hello. Let's see, let's see. Here we are, live on Facebook. Let me quickly share the chat of today, our live training, our weekly live training in the Facebook group. And then we're called live on Facebook as well, excuse me, on Instagram as well. And speak about a very important topic. Today's a very important topic, something that um, you inspired me to speak about, actually. Let me see. Because over the past weeks, I have seen a lot of students, a lot of uh, people in our community translate their yoga scripts, whether that be for yoga asana or for your yoga, uh, your uh, meditation script. And I've seen them translating their scripts to English. And it seemed as if it happened word by word. So direct translations. And there is a very big problem with this, not just one. And there's a few big problems with this. And that's why I want to speak about that today. So if you're joining me on Facebook, let me know who you are. I can't see. Um, it's really nice to see you here on Instagram. Krasi Petrova has just joined us. And I'm just going to wait a moment for everyone to connect, for everyone to say hi. And in the meantime, if you're watching, let me know, uh, do you translate your scripts? And if you do, how do you do this? What type of tools do you use to translate your scripts? Either for asana classes, so physical yoga classes, or for uh, meditation and mindfulness practices, for example. Do you translate? And if you do, how do you translate them? Just making sure we're all up and running. Giving you a moment to join, giving you a moment to say hi. And think about this question as well. I can't, there we go. Okay, seems like all good. Are you all receiving me all right? Is the connection all right? So for those that are new here, this is a weekly training. Every week is a different topic. I'm here every Wednesday. I used to be here every Thursday, but I've moved it to Wednesday. So it's a little bit getting used to for everyone. Um, but I'm here every Wednesday. I'm still deciding on the time and I will actually post something later on Instagram in the stories and you can vote for the best time for you because obviously I want you to be able to go uh, be live here with me. It's always nice to, to connect with you live and to speak to you personally. Hi, Belen, how are you doing? Lovely. And um, so let me know the best times that work for you. All right. So let's dive in. Topic of today. Why is it a bad idea to translate your scripts? Why is it a bad idea to translate? There's nothing wrong with translation as long as you know how to do it. And that's why I want to speak about this today. Because translation is a skill and it's not something a lot of us were born with knowing how to do. I wasn't either. And there are people that go to school to actually learn how to do this. They've got um, proper certificates and proper education for this because it's something that takes a little bit more effort than just using Google Translate or using any type of translation software. And I'm going to give you examples. So I typed a, a sentence into Google, into Google Translate, and the sentence was, learning to become fluent in a language depends on your willingness to make an effort. And I typed it into Google Translate, translating it to Dutch, because that's another language I speak fluently. And what came out was fluent leren worden in een taal hangt af van uw bereidheid om hem in te spannen. For those that do speak Dutch, you might already uh, find that this sounds funny. For those that don't, I'm going to explain what happened to this sentence. Basically, Google Translate completely ruined the word order. 
They made the pronouns too formal and it lost the meaning of the sentence. When you translate this sentence that I just translated to Dutch and you translate it back to English, it says, fluent learning becoming in a language depends on your will to strain. The word order is wrong, point number one. The use of the tense is incorrect. And the final verb of this translation doesn't actually make sense in this context because it has a completely different meaning that's not used when we speak about learning in this context. Okay, strain is, is a different verb that you might use as a yoga teacher when you strain your ankle, for example, but not when you speak about your willingness to learn. And the reason that I know that these sentences of this translation is wrong is because the um, because I speak both languages fluently. But imagine I was less familiar with either language and the translation would seem fine to me. And I would post it in social media or I would use it in a class or use it in any of the workshops that I do. And no one engaged with it or no one understood me. You know, we can ask ourselves why that is, or if we um, maybe are not interesting enough, for example, but it really is just bad translation that doesn't make sense to the listener or to the person of which this target language, um, of, which, of the person that, who speaks this target language. So sometimes when we translate words or phrases from our own language directly into another, the meaning gets lost. And that's because different languages have different grammar structures and distinct ways of ordering information. And they also come with their own sense of humor, the ways of showing emotion, uh, the ways of sharing and, and ordering information. They, um, each language and even the every uh, dialect of each language has its own style, their own self communication. And there's often no direct equivalent of the same expression in both languages. So when meaning, the feeling and the effect of language are changed at the moment of translation, that's when we use the phrase lost in translation. You might have actually heard that phrase before, lost in translation. Let me just, hi, Chewy, how are you doing, lovely? So lost in translation, have you heard that phrase before? Who's heard that phrase before? If you're watching on Facebook, let me know how you're feeling today and if you translate, if this is something that you've been struggling with and how you do it these days. Let me just see who's here. Jose is here from Angola. Really nice. Nice to see you here. Okay. So going back to the training. Um, lost in translation. Let me just drink some water. <laughs> Lost in translation means that when something is translated, it loses effectiveness and meaning. Translation apps, even though they have improved a lot, I have to say they have improved a lot, but they aren't always correct. And often they are too literal and don't consider wider context or alternatives. And this is problematic when, because, it means there is no intention behind the words that there's that you have chosen. They are selected by a robot who has only one option to choose from in the first place, or maybe two or three options, but doesn't know which one because it doesn't know what you feel or really want to say from your emotion or your perspective. So without the freedom for this robot to choose which words out of several to choose from, to choose your tone of voice, whether to speak with humor or sarcasm, um, whether you want to be more literal or serious, you can no longer communicate the authentic message of your feelings that go with it. In other cases, trans translation can actually cause and result in confusing, offensive, non-inclusive language. And especially in the context of teaching yoga, this can be really awkward and harmful to your students. 
So the language we use in our yoga classes is very specific. It's descriptive, it can be instructional, it can be metaphorical, and our students will be very sensitive to it. And remember that people come to your class to connect their minds, body and breath. They come to find a type of relief, become present, to disconnect from the outside world or their daily life. Um, and they have all their own personal reasons. as countless personal reasons for which your students come to your classes. But your students want to be able to follow your guidance and your words without having to think about what you say or to look up to see what you're doing. So it's really important that your language is considerate and appropriate. And for those reasons, paying attention to the words that you use is crucial. It's really important that you do this. And I see Guido, she's here, Leonardo, Gabi, really nice to see you all. We're speaking about translations today. Hola. <laughs> speaking about translation today and why this is problematic. So, like I said, the words that you choose and paying attention to the words that you choose is crucial. So why translation can be... Um, hablo espanol, nice to meet you. I also speak Spanish, so if you have questions in Spanish, feel free to send it to me. And for you, this chat will be very interesting because it's all about translating your yoga scripts or your, your yoga asana scripts or your mindfulness scripts. Si hablo en español también. <laughs> you can write me in Spanish. So why translation can be problematic? As an English learner, you may have studied prepositions. Prepositions are an excellent example of types of words that get, get misinterpreted and cause confusion when you try to translate them. If you're a Spanish speaker, listen, if you're a Spanish speaker and you think of the word sobre, which in English means on, but also upon, it also means over and above. Translate sobre to the German word uber, which in English means over and above, but also about and across. All of these prepositions are used in yoga. We use them all the time, but they don't mean the same thing in English. And if you start translating them from the language that you speak, can become very confusing. In, in, in yoga, we need a lot of prepositions to describe where we want to move or where we want to position something, how we should move somewhere. And now imagine that you had asked your students to lift your arm, preposition, your head, or place your left foot, preposition, your knee. Which prepositions would you have chosen? Which ones would you have chosen? Lift your arm over, ah, sorry, <laughs> lift your arm, your head, or place your left foot, your knee. Because I'm afraid that simply translating the words that you would use in your language doesn't always communicate the same meaning. And this is only about prepositions. Mistranslations of prepositions are very easy to do, but like I said, can be very confusing and can cause people or your students to stumble, so to wobble from one side or to fall over because they have to look at you, they are confused or they don't make sense and the action that you're trying to get from them actually isn't possible. So, Directly translating other types of language like phrases, expressions, but also vocabulary can also have a negative effect on your students. Think of the, the emotions that you activate with them or the relationship with, that you have with your students. They can easily be damaged by using mistranslations. So it's important to know that language is very deeply connected uh, very deeply connected or very deeply linked to our cultures. All right. So there's a book. There's a book that I really love. And the book is called Lost in Translation. 
The book is called Lost in Translation. And it explains the meaning of words that only exist in one language. These type of words tell us a lot about a culture, about a local community, maybe their culture's attitude toward, toward life, <laughs> to life um, their lifestyles, their perspectives on the rest of the world, their perspectives on life in general. And the words and language we use have a strong emotional association. And whenever we translate a single word, the translation doesn't necessarily carry the same meaning. If you do speak more than one language, think of a word in another language than uh, English that doesn't have a translation. In Spanish, there are a lot. I know that in Dutch and in German, there are a lot. And all of these words say something about the way people live in their life, see things or perspectives, or maybe even reflect something from their uh, history, their, their historical aspects of the culture. Yes, we also have yoga classes online. There is weekly yoga classes on our membership and you can find it on engayunite.com or in the link in my bio. Yeah, since you're on Instagram, you can find it there. So, excuse me, let me just turn off email here. So, going back to the translation of single words, phrases and expression. There are other things that you need to take into account when you translate in the context where loads of different cultures, languages, opinions and lifestyles meet. And think of our community. We have a lot of different people from all around the world that all live in different countries and also come from different backgrounds and cultures. And this can be the case in your international yoga classes too. If you, as a teacher, want to communicate humor or sarcasm and you find something funny that may not be funny at all for your students and for many people and possibly you as well, sarcasm just seems like a lie and sees that something, something that's not true or something that is made up. So it's invented. But in some European countries, for example, like the UK, the UK has a very sarcastic perspective on, perspective on life and it's very normal to use humor in the way that they speak or to make fun of other people while actually they find each other really, really nice and they feel comfortable around each other and that's why they do it. So things like humor or irony or expressions of emotion, the tone of voice, anything that you want to communicate through language can change when they are received by a person that isn't familiar with that culture or with the other language, all right? So language is very dependent on a culture, but it's also very personal, very, very, very personal. The language that you use in a yoga class or the language that you use as a yoga teacher is deeply personal. Not only are your words and your own expression, uh, sorry, your words are the, your own expression of your personal ideas, of your knowledge, of your feelings, but it can really affect your students and in many, many, many different ways because we don't always know what, the, what background they come from, what culture they come from, what beliefs they have, and what perspectives they have. And for that reason, it's our responsibility to pay attention to the word that we use in our classes, but also in our overall communication on social media, in your emails, in your text messages, when you um, have them on the phone and you explain something about your classes in your overall communication, it's important that you pay attention to the words that you use. Remember at the start of this chat that I mentioned translation can result in confusing, offensive, non-inclusive language. And I also said, translation apps are often incorrect or too literal and don't consider context or alternatives. Take, for example, the word thin. 
being thin or being uh, fat is the opposite. Being big or being small depends on your environment and your personal experience. For a person who struggles to find food and needs to work really hard to, but still doesn't gain weight, being thin can be a symbol of ill health or a struggle. It can be something very negative for them. For others, and especially those that live in environments that have been influenced by the media that promote thinness as a beautiful thing, being thin might actually might be might actually be a good thing. It might be a good thin thing to be thin. <laughs> it's almost like a tongue twister. So depending on your personal situation, sin can both be negative or positive or have either a negative or a positive association. And as a yoga teacher, you help to choose your, you um, to help your help you choose your language wisely, you need to consider what the connotations. So connotations is a synonym of associations. So you need to consider what the connotations are, uh, what the connotations are of the words that you use. Think of very similar words to thin. For example, skinny or slim. One of these has a more negative connotation and could actually activate an, um, negative emotions for your students. Which of these words do you think is used the best in your classes? I would like to hear that from you. Which do you think is better to use in your classes? Skinny or slim? So Belen is saying in Argentina, people are quite sarcastic, but we, but with people we know really well, if not strange people, usually get angry with sarcastic comments. Exactly. It, this is another point. Even though you live in the same country and you speak the same language, people don't always know what you mean with your sarcastic or your, your sarcastic comments or your humor. So it's really important that we pay attention to the way we speak and the words we use. So Belen or Belou is saying slim. Slim would be her choice. What about those that are watching on Facebook? What do you think is the way to go in your yoga class using skinny or slim? Um, where's the video? And see it here. Do you also speak Portuguese? I'm learning. I'm learning Portuguese. I'm not very good at it. I speak Spanish fluently, but Portuguese, not really. <laughs> I'm trying. Get on my way. Slim. Slim would be the option. Edna says. And Belu also said slim. Absolutely. Slim. Personally, and this is my perspective, this is the way that I have learned and what I understand from it, because remember, it's personal and it depends on who you speak to, but I would also say slim, because slim is a saver um, word, and again, based on my understanding and experience of its association, slim is probably the most neutral way to explain that something isn't thick, fat, or big, which all of these words, thick, fat, or big, also have their own problemat problematic associations. So even just choosing another synonym isn't enough. We have to study all of these words in context. And I'm going to go there in a moment from now. I'm going to tell you what to do to actually choose your words better. The point is that direct translations can not only be incorrect, but also very activating for those that suffer from any type of trauma. And that personal experience and cultural backgrounds influence those feelings. So it can be your culture, it can be your experience in life, it can be trauma uh, based, it can be any type of fear that people struggle with, but it's very important that we study these words in context. So how, how then can we translate the scripts more safely? 
So the students, for example, Belu, that's, that's watching on Instagram today, the students that are on the English for Yoga teachers course, and they have just started module two, I'm very excited about it. So the students that are on the English for Yoga teacher course, but also the people that are now on the membership. So we've just opened the doors for the membership. They are immersed in their language learning for their job as a yoga teacher. And that's exactly what you need to do. So immersion isn't only necessary to gain confidence and fluently, it's also the only way to get used to hearing and seeing this language regularly and to making the language your own and learning to use the language as native speakers do. And this is different from sounding like a native. This is all about using the language like native speakers do. So working with other yoga teachers who are international helps you to start considering how different our experiences are and how you can accommodate these experiences, how you can accommodate to them in your teaching. You start to develop um, your own experience of the connotations. So remember, connotations are associations. And um, so you start to experience them, recognize them. And because you are constantly immersed with it, you can see and hear it for yourself, but most of all, experience it for yourself. So immersion looks different for everybody. Remember that everyone has their own learning style and their own way of processing information. So immersion looks different for everybody, but it isn't just about the words that you choose. In order to start understanding the significance um, of the words and their associations, you need to be exposed to the language as much as possible. So immersion always evolve, in, uh, involves in, immersion always involves regular practice of all skills. And for those that are on the course and on the membership, you know that there are four skills, but I actually, actually believe there is a fifth skill. And the four skills are writing, writing, reading, listening, and speaking, like you learn in any other general English class or exam preparation. But also what's necessary is practice and active revision of vocabulary which I call independent learning. And this is what I also say or consider the fifth skill. Independent learning, which includes practice and active revision of vocabulary. So when learning the language you need for teaching yoga, it's key to read about the topics that you teach, uh, that you teach uh, in English. So read about the topics that you want to teach. If you teach uh, yoga to um, people that are pregnant, so pre or postnatal yoga, read about those things in English. If you teach yoga to children, read children's books in English. So really start to understand who you're teaching and also find the words that they will be using in your classes and when they speak to you. So also sign up for classes and workshops with your English English speaking yoga teachers and practice your listening skills while you do so. Then get out there to practice your speaking. Speak about these topics with other learners and speak about some, uh, speak about these topics with someone that understands the struggle of learning a language and can help and correct you when it's necessary. And then when you do these things, make sure that you record whatever you are learning. Keep a journal. And if you're more um, techn uh, into technology, keep a Google document or an online journal with your notes and vocabulary. Write down everything that you need to remember. And actually, I'm going to go live on Friday to speak about memorization techniques for yoga teachers. So if you are interested in this and want to find out how you can memorize better, sign up for that as well. The link is in my bio on Instagram and I will link to it here on Facebook later. Um, so yes, make, make sure that you also record everything. So write down everything, vocabulary, um, your notes, anything that you need to remember. 
and make uh, and make an effort, make an effort to practice this actively and practice all of this in context, not just single words. So to practice in context, I have created the continuing education membership. This is especially for yoga teachers that want to learn and especially improve, more specifically improve, their yoga teaching skills in English. In the world of teaching yoga, I believe that there is too little attention for non-native English speaking yoga teachers. There's a lot of resources out there, a lot of really great education in English, but there's not a lot of attention for people that want to study all of this, but don't speak the language. So when I completed my first yoga teacher training, I felt really misunderstood and undervalued. I felt really low of myself and I didn't, I felt really uh, bad about myself for not knowing the right vocabulary for my yoga classes. And I really doubted my own ability to teach yoga in English, even though I was already teaching English as my full-time job. So I spoke English fluently. I had a C2 certificate. I, I've been teaching English for maybe three, four years already. And I doubted my own skills to teach yoga in English. I felt much misunderstood and undervalued simply for not knowing the right vocabulary for my job as a yoga teacher. So that's why I'm here for you today. And that's why I've uh, created the English for Yoga Teachers course. That's why I've created the continuing education membership because I want to help you learn to communicate what you truly want to say and offer effective, accessible and authentic yoga classes that your students will love and that you no longer have to doubt your translations, the way you speak, your accent, your pronunciation, so that you can finally teach with confidence and with clarity. I want you to know that I'm here for you and I'm here to help you develop and improve. And if you have any questions about this topic or anything related to teaching yoga and learning English, I'm here for you as well. So two really important things I wanna point out at the end of this, I want to know from you if you need help with your translations, if you need help with finding the right vocabulary for your script. And if you do, do not hold back. Send me a message. Send me a message and let me help you. The second thing, um, on Friday, we've got the memorization techniques for yoga teacher vocabulary webinar. And it's at 1 p.m. CES, no, it's CET. Since we have changed the clock, it's now Central European time. Um, but if you can't make it live, you can still register so I can send a recording of the webinar to your email. And the, the webinar, like all other trainings, come with uh, worksheets so you can um, go through this in your own time, at your own pace and really make the most of your learning um, journey. And the other thing, the last thing is that the continuing education membership is now on a free trial. So we have open house, which means that you can try all our self-paced learning materials for free. And you can also try all the live classes for free. So the self-paced learning includes a vocabulary builder for yoga teachers, um, worksheets to practice all of your skills. There are listening, writing, reading exercises. And you have access to the Teach Yoga and English mini course. Normally you have to pay $50 for that, but it's now free. So you can go and check that out. The live classes are yoga classes, uh, conversation classes, and also week, sorry, monthly, monthly teacher training. And the hours of those training count towards your continuing education hours if you are registered with Yoga Alliance. So if you want to check that out, if you want to try it for free, this is your chance. The free access will expire on the 19th of November. So you've got nine days left only, nine days left to try it out for free. And like I said, if you need help with your translation, I'm here for you. I would absolutely love for you to reach out and ask your questions. 
And ask your questions now if you have any. Let me know. Do you have any questions about the training of today? Any questions about the webinar or questions about... Um, <laughs> what else did we speak about? Now I think the continuing education membership. Any questions? Any, any, any questions? It's always a little bit of a delay, so I'm just going to wait a moment and see if there's anything coming in. If you join me later, if you join me later, feel free to watch the replay or go back through to the start. So really make sure that you have, haven't missed anything about why it's so important that we pay attention to the words that we choose and how we do this. And as there's no questions for the moment. All right then, that's great. Let me know as well what you thought of this training, if it's been useful for you. Like I said, if you need help, let me know sign up for the webinar i would absolutely love to see you there and don't forget that you can try the membership for free until the 19th of november so you've got nine days left if you're watching this live um and just check your calendar if you're watching this another day all right thank you so much for for spending your time with me today for checking in and working on your um personal and your professional development and I would absolutely love to see you again next week. Next week, we'll be back on Wednesday. Um, and Friday, we will be back here with the webinar. All right. I'll see you all later. Have a lovely rest of your day. And sending you lots and lots of love. See you later. <laughs>